Part One, Chapter Four, of Little Eve Edgerton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Eve Edgerton by Eleanor Hallowell Abbott. Part One, Chapter Four. The Edgertons did not start for Melbourne the following day, nor the next, nor the next, nor even the next. In a head bandage much more scientific than a blue ribboned petticoat, but infinitely less decorative, little Eve Edgerton lay imprisoned among her hotel pillows. Twice a day, and oftener if he could justify it, the village doctor came to investigate pulse and temperature. Never before in all his humdrum winter experience or occasional summer tourist vagary had he ever met any people who prated of camels instead of motor cars or deprecated the dust of Abyssinia on their Piccadilly shoes or sighed indiscriminately for the snow tinted breezes of the Klondike and Ceylon. Never either in all his full round of experience had the village doctor had a surgical patient as serenely complacent as little eve edgerton or any anxious relative as madly restive as little eve edgerton's father for the first twenty-four hours of course mr edgerton was much too worried over the accident to his daughter to think for a moment of the accident to his railway and steamship tickets for the second twenty-four hours he was very naturally so much concerned with the readjustment of his railway and steamship tickets that he never concerned himself at all with the accident to his plans by the end of the third twenty-four hours with his first two worries reasonably eliminated it was the accident to his plans that smote upon him with the fiercest poignancy let a man's clothes and togs vacillate as they will between his trunk and his bureau once that man's spirit is packed for a journey Nothing but journey's end can ever unpack it again. With his own heart tuned already to the heart throb of an engine, his pale eyes focused squintingly toward expected novelties, his thin nostrils half a sniff with the first salty scent of the far away. Mr. Edgerton, whatever his intentions, was not the most ideal of sick room companions. Too conscientious to leave his daughter, too unhappy to stay with her he spent the larger part of his days and nights pacing up and down like a caged beast between the two bedrooms it was not till the fifth day however that his impatience actually burst the bounds he had set for it somewhere between his maple bureau and eve's mahogany bed the actual explosion took place and in that explosion every single infinitesimal wrinkle of brow cheek chin nose was called into play as if here at last was a man who intended once and for all to wring his face perfectly dry of all human expression eve heased her father i hate this place i loathe this place i abominate it i despise it the flora is execrable the fauna nil and as to the coffee the breakfast coffee oh ye gods eve if we are delayed here another week i shall die die mind you at sixty-two with my life-work just begun eve i hate this place i abominate it i de really mused little eve edgerton from her white pillows why i think it's lovely eh demanded her father what it's so social said little eve edgerton social choked her father as bereft of expression as if robbed of both inner and outer vision little eve edgerton lifted her eyes to his why two of the hotel ladies have almost been to see me she confided listlessly and the chambermaid brought me the picture of her beau and the hotel proprietor lent me a story-book and mr social snapped her father oh of course if you got killed in a fire or anything saving people's lives you'd sort of expect them to send you candy or make you some sort of a memorial 
considered little Eve Edgerton unemotionally. "'But when you break your head just amusing yourself, "'why, I thought it was nice for the hotel ladies to almost come to see me,' "'she finished without even so much as a flicker of the eyelids. "'Disgustedly, her father started for his own room, "'then whirled abruptly in his tracks and glanced back "'at that imperturbable little figure in the big white bed, Except for the scarcely perceptible hound-like flicker of his nostrils, his own face held not a whit more expression than the girl's. "'Eve,' he asked casually, "'Eve, you're not changing your mind, are you, about Nuncanono and John Elbertson?' "'Good old John Elbertson,' he repeated feelingly. "'Eve,' he quickened with sudden sharpness, "'surely nothing has happened to make you change your mind about Nuncanono?' "'And good old John Albertson?' "'Oh, no, father,' said little Eve Edgerton. "'Indolently she withdrew her eyes from her father's "'and stared off Nuncanona Ward "'in a hazy geographical sort of a dream. "'Good old John Albertson! "'Good old John Albertson!' "'She began to croon very soft to herself. "'Good old John Albertson! "'How I do love his kind brown eyes! "'How I do—' "'Brown eyes,' snapped her father. "'Brown, John Elbertson's got the grayest eyes that I ever saw in my life.' Without the slightest ruffle of composure, little Eve Edgerton accepted the correction. "'Oh, has he?' she conceded amiably. "'Well, then, good old John Elbertson, good old John Elbertson, how I do love his kind gray eyes,' she began all over again. Palpably Edgerton shifted his standing weight from one foot to the other. I understood your mother, he asserted a bit defiantly. Did you, dear? I wonder, mused little Eve Edgerton. Eh? jerked her father. Still with a vague geographical dream in her eyes, little Eve Edgerton pointed off suddenly toward the open lid of her steamer trunk. Oh, my manuscript notes, father, please she ordered almost peremptorily. John's notes, you know, I might as well be working on them while I'm lying here. Obediently from the tuzzled top of the steamer trunk, her father returned with a great batch of rough manuscript. And my pencil, please, persisted little Eve Edgerton, and my eraser, and my writing board, and my ruler, and my... Absent-mindedly, one by one, Edgerton handed the articles to her, and then sank down on the foot of her bed, with his thin-lipped mouth contorted into a rather mirthless grin. "'Don't care much for your old father, do you?' he asked, trenchantly. Gravely for a moment, the girl sat studying her father's weather-beaten features. The thin hair, the pale shrewd eyes, the gaunt cheeks, the indomitable old young mouth— then a little shy smile flickered across her face and was gone again. "'As a parent, dear,' she drawled, "'I love you to distraction. "'But as a daily companion?' "'Vaguely her eyebrows lifted. "'As a real playmate?' "'Against the starch white of her pillows, "'the sudden flutter of her small brown throat "'showed with almost startling distinctness. "'But as a real playmate,' she persisted evenly, you're so intelligent, and you travel so fast. It tires me. Whom do you like? asked her father sharply. The girl's eyes were suddenly sullen again, bored, distrait, inestimably dreary. That's the whole trouble, she said. You've never given me time to like anybody. Oh, but Eve, pleaded her father. Awkward as any schoolboy, he sat there fuming and twisting before this absurd little bunch of nerve and nerves that he himself had begotten. Oh, but Eve, he deprecated helplessly, it's the deuce of a job for a, for a man to be left all alone in the world with a, with a daughter. Really it is. Already the sweat had started on his forehead and across one cheek the old gray fretwork of wrinkles began to shadow suddenly. "'I've done my best,' he pleaded. "'I swear I have. Only I've never known how. "'With a mother now,' he stammered, "'with a wife, with a sister, with your best friend's sister, "'you know just what to do. "'It's a definite relation. 
prescribed by a definite emotion. But a daughter, oh ye gods, your whole sexual angle of vision changed. A creature neither fish, flesh, nor fowl. Non-superior, non-contemporaneous, non-subservient, just a lady, a strange lady. Yes, that's exactly it, Eve, a strange lady, growing eternally just a little bit more strange, just a little bit more remote every minute of her life. Yet it's so damned intimate all the time, he blurted out passionately. All the time she's rowing you about your manners and your morals. All the time she's laying down the law to you about the tariff or the turnips. You're remembering how you used to scrub her in her first little blue-lined tin bathtub. Once again the flickering smile flared up in little Eve Edgerton's eyes and was gone again. A trifle self-consciously she burrowed back into her pillows. When she spoke her voice was scarcely audible. Oh, I know I'm funny, she admitted conscientiously. You're not funny, snapped her father. Yes, I am, whispered the girl. No, you're not, reasserted her father with increasing vehemence. You're not. It's I who am funny. It's I who... In a chaos of emotion, he slid along the edge of the bed and clasped her in his arms. Just for an instant, his wet cheek grazed hers, then... All the same, you know, he insisted awkwardly. I hate this place. Surprisingly, little Eve Edgerton reached up and kissed him full on the mouth. They were both very much embarrassed. Why, why, Eve, stammered her father. Why, my little, little girl, why, you haven't kissed me before since you were a baby. Yes, I have, nodded little Eve Edgerton. No, you haven't, snapped her father. Yes, I have, insisted Eve. Tighter and tighter, their arms clasped around each other. You're all I've got, faltered the man brokenly. You're all I've ever had, whispered Lily Edgerton. Silently, for a moment, each according to his thoughts, sat staring off into far places. Then, without any warning whatsoever, the man reached out suddenly and tipped his daughter's face up abruptly into the light. Eve, he demanded, Surely you're not blaming me any in your heart because I want to see you safely married and settled with, with John Albertson? Vaguely, like a child repeating a dimly understood lesson, little Eve Edgerton repeated the phrases after him. Oh, no, father, she said, I surely am not blaming you in my heart for wanting to see me married and settled with John Albertson. Good old John Albertson, she corrected painstakingly. With his hand still holding her little chin like a vise, the man's eyes narrowed to his further probing. Eve, he frowned, I'm not as well as I used to be. I've got pains in my arms, and they're not good pains. I shall live to be a thousand. But I, I might not. It's a rotten world, Eve, he brooded, and quite unnecessarily crowded, it seems to me, with essentially rotten people. Towards the starving and the crippled and the hideously distorted, the world, having no envy of them, shows always an amazing mercy. And beauty, whatever its sorrows, can always retreat to the thick protecting wall of its own conceit. But as for the rest of us, he grinned with a sudden convulsive twist of the eyebrow, God help the unduly prosperous and the merely plain. From the former, always, envy like a wolf shall tear down every fresh talent, every fresh treasure they lift to their aching backs, and from the latter brutal neglect shall ravage away even the charm that they thought they had. It's a, a rotten world, Eve, I tell you, he began all over again a bit plaintively, a rotten world, and the pains in my arms, I tell you, are not nice, distinctly not nice. Sometimes, Eve, you think I'm making faces at you, but believe me, it isn't faces that I'm making. It's my heart that I'm making at you. And believe me, the pain is not nice. Before the sudden winds in his daughter's eyes, he reverted instantly to an air of semi-jocosity. So, under all existing circumstances, little girl, he hastened to affirm, you can hardly blame a crusty old codger of a father for preferring to leave his daughter in the hands of a man whom he positively knows to be good, than in the hands of some casual stranger who, 
just in a negative way he merely can't prove isn't good oh eve eve he pleaded sharply you'll be so much better off out of the world you've got infinitely too much money and infinitely too little self-conceit to be happy here they would break your heart in a year but at nonconono he cried eagerly oh eve think of the peace of it just white beach and a blue sea the long low endless horizon and john will make you a garden and women i have often heard are very happy in a garden and slowly little eve edgerton lifted her eyes again to his has john got a beard she asked why why i'm sure i don't remember stammered her father why yes i think so why yes indeed i dare say is it a grayish beard asked little eve edgerton why why yes i shouldn't wonder admitted her father and reddish persisted little eve edgerton and longish as long as illustratively with her hands she stretched to her full arm's length yes i think perhaps it is reddish conceded her father but why oh nothing mused little eve edgerton only sometimes at night i dream about you and me landing at nonconono and john in a great big long reddish gray beard always comes crunching down at full speed across the hermit crabs to meet us and always just before he reaches us he he trips on his beard and falls headlong into the ocean and is drowned why what an awful dream deprecated her father awful queried little eve edgerton ha it makes me laugh all the same she affirmed definitely good old john elbertson will have to have his beard cut quizzically for an instant she stared off into space then quite abruptly she gave a quick funny little sniff anyway i'll have a garden won't i she said and always of course there will be henrietta henrietta frowned her father my daughter explained little eve edgerton with dignity your daughter snapped edgerton oh of course there may be several conceded little eve edgerton but henrietta i'm almost positive will be the best one so jerkily she thrust her slender throat forward with a speech her whole facial expression seemed suddenly to have undercut and stunned her father's always father she attested grimly with your horrid old books and specimens you have crowded my dolls out of my steamer trunk but never once her tightening lips hastened to assure him have you ever succeeded in crowding henrietta and the others out of my mind quite incongruously then with a soft little hand in which there lurked no animosity whatsoever she reached up suddenly and smoothed the astonishment out of her father's mouth lines after all father she asked now that we're really talking so intimately after all there isn't so specially much to life anyway is there except just the satisfaction of making the complete round of human experience once for yourself and then once again to show another person just that double chance father of getting two original glimpses at happiness one through your own eyes and one just a little bit dimmer through the eyes of another with merciless appraising vision the starving youth that was in her glared up at the satiate age in him you've had your complete round of human experience father she cried your first full untrammeled glimpse of all your heart's desires more of a glimpse perhaps than most people get from your tiniest boyhood father everything just as you wanted it just the tutors you chose in just the subjects you chose everything then that american colleges could give you everything later that european universities could offer you and then travel and more travel and more and more and then love and then fame love fame and far lands yes that's it exactly everything just as you chose it so your only tragedy father lies as far as i can see in just little me because i don't happen to be i don't happen to like the things that you like the things that you already have had the first full joy of liking 
You've got to miss altogether your dimmer, second-hand glimpse of happiness. Oh, I'm sorry, father, truly I am. Already I sense the hurt of these latter years, the shattered expectations, the incessant disappointments. You who have stared unblinkingly into the face of the sun, robbed in your twilight of even a candle flame. But, father— Grimly, despairingly, but with unfalteringly persistence, youth fighting with its last gasp for the rights of its youth, she lifted her haggard little face to his. But, father, my tragedy lies in the fact that at thirty I've never yet had even my first-hand glimpse of happiness, and now apparently, unless I'm willing to relinquish all hope of ever having it, and consent to settle down, as you call it, with good old John Albertson, I'll never even get a gamble probably, at sighting happiness second-hand through another person's eyes. "'Oh, but Eve!' protested her father. Nervously he jumped up and began to pace the room. One side of his face was quite grotesquely distorted, and his lean fingers, thrust precipitously into his pockets, were digging frenziedly into their own palms. "'Oh, but Eve!' he reiterated sharply. "'You will be happy with John. I know you will.' John is a... John is a... Underneath all that slowness, that ponderous slowness, that... that... underneath that... that longish, reddish, grayish beard, interpolated little Eve Edgerton. Glaringly for an instant, the old eyes and the young eyes challenged each other, and then the dark eyes retreated suddenly before not the strength, but the weakness of their opponents. "'Oh, very well, father,' assented little Eve Edgerton. Only, ruggedly, the soft little chin thrust itself forth into stubborn outline again. "'Only, father,' she articulated with inordinate distinctness, "'you might just as well understand here and now. I won't budge one inch toward non -Kanono. Not one single solitary little inch toward non -Kanono. Unless at London—' or Lisbon, or Odessa, or somewhere, you let me fill up all the trunks I want to, with just plain pretties, to take to non -Kanono. It isn't exactly, you know, like a bride moving fifty miles out from town somewhere, she explained painstakingly. When a bride goes out to a place like non -Kanono, it isn't enough, you understand, but she takes just the things she needs. What she's got to take, you see, is everything under the sun that she ever may need. With a little soft sigh of finality, she sank back into her pillows, and then struggled up for one brief instant again to add a postscript, as it were, to her ultimatum. "'If my day is over, without ever having been begun,' she said, "'why, it's over without ever having been begun, and that's all there is to it. But when it comes to Henrietta,' she mused, "'Henrietta's going to have five-inch hair ribbons, and everything else from the very start.' Eh? frowned Edgerton and started for the door. And, oh, father, called Eve just as his hand touched the doorknob, there's something I want to ask you for Henrietta's sake. It's rather a delicate question, but after I'm married I suppose I shall have to save all my delicate questions to ask John, and John somehow has never seemed to me particularly canny about anything except geology. Father, she asked, just what is it that you consider so particularly obnoxious in in young men is it their sins sins jerked her father bah it's their traits so questioned the leave edgerton from her pillows so such as what such as the pursuit of woman snapped her father the love not of woman but of the pursuit of woman on all sides you see it to-day on all sides you hear it, sense it, suffer it. The young man's eternally jocose sexual appraisement of woman. Is she young? Is she pretty? And always eternally. Is there any one younger? Is there any one prettier? Sins, you ask. Suddenly now he seemed perfectly willing, even anxious, to linger and talk. A sin is nothing, oftener than not, but a mere accidental, non-considered act. A yellow streak quite as exterior as a scorch of a sunbeam. And there is no sin existent that a man may not repent of. 
and there is no honest repentance eve that a wise woman cannot make over into a basic foundation for happiness but a trait a congenital tendency a yellow streak bred in the bone why eve if a man loves i tell you not woman but the pursuit of woman so that wherever he wins he wastes again so that indeed at last he wins only to waste moving eternally on 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 from one ravaged lure to another eve would i deliver over you your mother's reincarnated body to to such as that oh said little eve edgerton her eyes were quite wide with horror how careful i shall have to be with henrietta eh snapped her father ting-a-ling ling 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 trilled the telephone from the farther side of the room impatiently edgerton came back and lifted the receiver from its hook hello he growled who what eh with quite unnecessary vehemence he rammed the palm of his hand against the mouthpiece and glared back over his shoulder at his daughter it's that that barton he said the impudence of him he wants to know if you are receiving visitors to-day he wants to know if he can come up the yes isn't it awful stammered little eve edgerton imperiously her father turned back to the telephone ting-a-ling ling 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 chirped the bell right in his face as if he were fairly trying to bite the transmitter he thrust his lips and teeth into the mouthpiece my daughter he enunciated with extreme distinctness is feeling quite exhausted exhausted this afternoon we appreciate of course mr barton your what hello there he interrupted himself sharply mr barton barton now what in the deuce he called back appealingly toward the bed why he's rung off the fool quite accidentally then his glance lighted on his daughter why what are you smoothing your hair for he called out accusingly oh just to put it on acknowledged little eve edgerton but what in creation are you putting on your coat for he demanded tartly oh just to smooth it acknowledged little eve edgerton with a sniff of disgust edgerton turned on his heel and strode off into his own room End of part one chapter four